And so this morning, I want to talk to you about being light. And we're going to look at some things on how to be light. But first, let's look at the Word of God so we can see that we are called to be light. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, out of the King James Version. And I know you guys are familiar with these scriptures. But you know what? It doesn't matter how many times we've heard the Word of God. He can show us something new. Amen. So let this get in your heart this morning because it's only the revelation, it's only what you believe that you live by. If you don't believe something, you don't live by it. I believe in the tithes, therefore I'm a tither. Amen. I believe Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, therefore my life is completely yielded to him. What am I trying to say? It's what you believe that you live. And so if you are going to live as light, you must first believe that you are light. If you're going to give something to this world, you must first believe that you have something to give them. Somebody say amen. Amen. So here in Matthew 5, 14 and 16, he said, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light shine before men. Someone say, let my light shine. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I really like the way that this reads out in the message. We know we don't study from the message, but sometimes it makes the text very plain where we can get new understanding from it. So Matthew 5, 14 through 16 on the Message Bible says, here's another way to put it. You are here to be light, bringing out the God colors in this world. I want to pause right there. The world's not going to bring out the God colors of this world. They're going to bring out whatever colors they want to be glorified. So if they're not going to bring out the God colors of this world, that means we have to do it. And so I like to say it this way. If the world's going to see God, they're going to see God through you. When someone looks at your life, you you are an apostle written in red of all men. When they look at your life, do they see him? When they look at your life, you know, I was in Damata School of Missions in Oklahoma before I went to Ramah, and there was a guest minister there. I forget what nation he was from, but he was sharing this story about how he was stopped on the plane by some random person who just walked up to him and said, I see Jesus in your eyes. Just a random person. What does that mean? That means that this man was so fellowshipping with God, so fellowshipping with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that there was a difference about his life, that everywhere he went, people were able to see Jesus in him. They were able to see the God colors of the world through this individual. If this world is going to see God, they're going to see him through you. What you say and what you do. We're here to bring out the God colors of this world. God is not a secret to be kept. We are going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Everyone say shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. I love that. And when I'm reading this scripture, um, as I was studying through the week, the Lord kind of showed me the way we're supposed to live is if I have any Star Wars fans in the house, which I am not, I had to ask somebody what one of those swords were that they swung around, and they they told me it's a lightsaber, and I told them, you're telling me the truth, so when I say it on Sunday, I don't look foolish, right? And they're like, no, it is a lightsaber. So apparently in Star Wars, they use these things called lightsabers, and when I was reading this, even though I'm not a Star Wars fan, the Lord said, your life is like a lightsaber. You are here to do damage to the kingdom of darkness. He's made you a light bearer. You are supposed to be a beacon of light. And the world is supposed to look at you. And when they look at you, they're supposed to find him. He said, as you're generous with your life, it will open people up to God. Listen to me. This came to my heart as I was studying. If the world is having a hard time finding Jesus, it's because there isn't enough light coming from the church. If the world is having a hard time finding Jesus, mm, it's because there's not enough light coming from the church. And you know, I was thinking about this. We see in the scriptures, it talks about how uh, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. We know that those that don't know him uh, are lost from him. But I also was looking at it a different way, just a small shift in my mind. Jesus is also lost to them. 
And in order for them to find him, there needs to be some light. Sometimes the simplest answer to finding something is just more light. I remember when I lived in Colorado and I lost my keys and uh, I was searching. I, I, listen, y'all, if you ever lose something and you need someone to pray the prayer of agreement, my phone is available to you. You can give me a call. I know how to believe God for lost things because I lose everything. My wife started doing this. You can find my coffee cups around here at the church because I leave them everywhere. And it says, if you found this, please return to Robert Conover. <laughs> You know, she gave me, I think it was actually Pav, gave me a little uh, beeper for my keys that when I would blow a whistle, they would start beeping, and then I lost the whistle. <laughs> she gave me something to find my keys, and then the thing he gave me to find my keys, I lost it. Hallelujah. And I lost my keys when I was in high school one time, and I called my dad, and I was like, pray, <laughs> believe God, I need to find my keys. And I remember I searched for them after school for hours and hours, and it was starting to get dark. And I thought within myself, if it gets dark out, I'm never going to find them. Why? Because without light, it's hard to find things. I've got a simple illustration to just take it to another level for us. If we could pro presenter black the screens for me, and then David, if you want to kill all the lights in the room, I know it's not going to get completely pitch black, but it'll help us understand what the Lord is trying to say to us. It's a process, I understand. <laughs> so there's a set of stairs here at the front of the room. I know they're there, they're to help me to get down safely, but without light, I can't see them, I can't find them. And it'd be foolish of me to walk off this stage not knowing where they are. It'd be foolish of me to try to do this without some light. They are there, but it's hidden to me. Jesus is here for the world, but he's hidden to them. If the world's having a hard time finding Jesus, it's because there's not enough light coming from the church. If you would, David, just turn on that one light that shines on this staircase. It's amazing. Just a little bit of light. Now I can go safely down. What was missing in my life is now found because of light. If you would, please turn all the other lights on. Jesus has been hidden from the world not on purpose, but because the church has not been doing their job. Everyone say, I'm called to be light. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, now the Amplified, says, Do everything without murmuring or questioning the providence of God, so that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and guileless, innocent and uncontaminated, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a morally crooked and spiritually perverted generation, among whom... You are seen as bright lights, beacon shining out clearly in the world of darkness, holding out an offering to everyone. This is the key. Holding out an offering to everyone the word of life. So that in the day of Christ, I will have, no, I will have reason to rejoice greatly because I did not run my race in vain or labor without results. results. You are called to be a beacon of light in a dark world. And as we let our shine, it'll help the lost find Jesus. So I want to talk very simply and very quickly. There's more we could add to this. But just about four things I believe we can do to enhance our light. Four things we can do to be light bearers in the world in which we live. Number one, to live as light, we must lose our lives for him. You can't, <laughs> hallelujah. You can't be light if you're also in the darkness. The does the Bible say? It says that you are in this world, but you are not of this world. What is Jesus saying to us? There's supposed to be something different about you. You don't sound like them. Come on now. Don't get quiet on me. You don't act like them. You don't talk like them. You don't believe like them. You love them, but at the same time, you don't conduct yourselves like them. Amen. You are the difference in the world. And the way this happens is by giving our lives completely to him. Let's go to Matthew 16. I believe this is one of, not Cornerstone, but the church's least favorite scriptures. And so it's funny that the Lord would bring me to this scripture because I've been asking for easier messages, but he keeps giving me hard ones. But I found out this is what the truth of God's word does. It challenges us. Amen. And if you're not being challenged, then you're not getting the truth. 
Amen. We're supposed to grow when we get this. And so here in chapter 16, verse 24, it says, And Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross, and follow me. If you try to keep your life for yourself, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find true life. In order to be beacons of light, we must lose our lives for him. We must ask ourselves, why are we doing this? Why am I here? Well, I'm here to be a beacon. Well, Jesus, what is the light? Well, you go to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He says, I am the life, and that life is the light of all men. So Jesus is the life, he is the word, and he's the light. Amen? And so in order to give the world light, we must give them Jesus, and we can't give them Jesus if we're constantly trying to give them ourselves. We can't want, he says, deny yourself and carry your cross. Did you know to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, your flesh must suffer? Amen. Amen. What does that mean? I know we're not supposed to suffer from the things he redeemed us from. I don't suffer from poverty just like you. We don't suffer from sickness and disease. We don't suffer, we don't suffer from eternal damnation. We've been saved. Amen. We've been healed by his stripes. He became poor that I could become rich. He took the curse upon him so I don't suffer with any of that. But the way I suffer is I crucify my flesh. I no longer get to do the things that Robert wants to do. I must deny myself and carry my cross. The church has made this mistake (laughs) where it's more about us instead of about him. What satisfies me instead of what satisfies God? What pleases me instead of what pleases God. And any time we choose ourselves over him, it diminishes the light. Someone said, that's good preaching. I know that it is. Over in John 3.30, we see John having a revelation of this. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. I like the way this reads out in New Living Translation. He says, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. What is he saying? This isn't about me. This is about you. And John, he had had gone around preparing the way in the wilderness. He had worked tirelessly. He had worked preaching. There's one coming who's greater than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to fill. And then when Jesus started to show up, John had to recognize, I need to take a step back. And it would have been easy for him to step into that place and say, no, 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 no. I've been out here, bud. I've been doing this. But he said, no, I'm taking a step back. John had this revelation. Jesus, and you all might think this saying is funny. Jesus, you're the goat. What does that mean? The greatest of all time. I'm just here to play a supporting role. And that's what he did. I was thinking about this and I, that song. It's an old song by Lecrae called The Background. I want to read just part of the verse to you. He says, I could play the background and you can take the lead. It's evident you run the show, so let me back down and I can play the background. Come on now. We need to lose our lives for him. Let Jesus take the lead and you step into the background. If you want to be light in a dark world, then your life must be about him. You have got to deny yourself, your ambitions, your desires. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.20. You know this scripture. He said, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is I who no longer lives, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I crucify myself. Oh, come on now. <laughs> I, the old me is gone. It's no lot because the Apostle Paul, you all remember the story, right? It was foretold to him what was coming. You remember when Agabus the prophet tied him up, took his belt off and tied his hands above his head and told the Apostle Paul, you will be persecuted for preaching the gospel. He knew these things were coming, but he said, I no longer live. See, God wants to elevate your life to be a beacon of light. In order to do that, you must say what the Apostle Paul said, it's no longer about me. I no longer live. Someone say, I'm a light. light. Romans 6.13 says, don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely 
to God. For you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. What is the key? Give yourself completely to this. I must lose my life for this. It's so cool. I'm just an instrument to make a beautiful sound for my king. I'm just an instrument for him to play that, that when that music comes from my life, it is a light to those who see it, a light to those who hear it. But it only happens if I give myself completely to this. So number one, to be light, you must give yourself completely to it. Number two, to be light, you must be bold. We are living in a generation where sometimes you are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Condemned, bullied, punished, ridiculed. So there's a few of them for what you believe. Persecuted. And even Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. You'll be persecuted for what you believe. But they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting him. In order for us to be light, we must be bold with the light. The church has lost some of its boldness. Just going to be playing with y'all. To live as a light in the darkness, you cannot agree with the darkness. Amen. Hmm. So let's look at some scriptures here. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. Mark 8.38, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes to his Father's glory with his holy angels. I'm not ashamed of his word. I was spending some time praying Friday night. And the Lord, uh, it was 2.30 in the morning. I couldn't sleep. I was praying. And the Lord put this on my heart for the parents in the room. And I tried to get away from it. And I just, he kept me up till 2.30 to pray about it. And he wouldn't let it go. He wouldn't let it go. I've been in youth ministry for 20 years. And I've seen a lot. Right here at Cornerstone Word of Life, 20 years, ministering to the students of this church. Had a lot of them come through the youth ministry who parents weren't involved in church. And we're still acquaintances on social media. And so I see what they post and also, I'm acquaintances with a lot of your teenagers on social media, so I see what they post. And the Lord told me on Friday night to speak to the parents, especially with younger children in elementary school, middle school, and high school. The Lord said this, so I'm just going to tell you the way he told me. He said, don't teach them to be politically correct. Teach them to be biblically correct. Don't teach your children to be politically correct. Teach them to be biblically correct. There's a lot of political correctness out there, and it flies directly in the face of God's word. And out of political correctness, the church has lost its boldness when it comes to the truths of God's word. So you don't teach your children... To be polite. See, uh, you know, and, and uh, Pastor Cody and myself, we get your teenagers for an hour and a half a week. That's it. And really, what we should be doing is reinforcing what they're already learning at home. You're the greatest teacher that they'll ever have. At least you ought to be. I'm grateful for elementary school teachers. I'm grateful for junior high teachers and high school teachers influencing young children, shaping their minds, being there for them. And I had some great teachers, but you know who the greatest teachers were in my life? My mom and dad. Don't get quiet on me now. You need to teach your children what's biblically correct when it comes to sexuality. Not politically correct. You ought to teach your children what's biblically correct when it comes to sex and marriage. Not politically correct, what's biblically correct. Huh, this is a good one. He gave me this Friday night. You ought to teach your children what's not politically correct, but what's biblically correct when it comes to authority. I did a whole service in the youth group about authority. 
And this is what the Lord told me. He said, teach them to respect authority. Because if you won't teach them to respect authority, the authority I've given them, they'll never walk in it because they don't have respect for authority to begin with. See, you've been given some authority. As a believer, it's called the believer's authority. And you need to teach your children to respect, especially when it comes to you, that they ought to have respect for you. When you speak, and you teach them to honor that. That way when they grow old and they've got some sickness and disease or they've got something trying to plague their family, the authority that they have, they'll believe in it, they'll respect it, therefore it'll work for them. Amen. Amen. Teach them how to be biblically correct. We refuse to let this generation be lost. Biblically correct. Even, listen, Jesus wasn't popular because he went with the world. He was popular because he went with his father. Be bold with what you have. The wicked, over in Proverbs 28, 1, it says, The wicked flee, though no one pursues them. But the righteous are as bold as lions. I was thinking about Jesus in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, where he met with the woman caught in adultery, and they brought her to the well. And the crowd was saying, Stone him. And I know, I want you to see what's interesting about this story. We don't have time to read it. But Jesus didn't agree with them, and he didn't agree with her. He wasn't influenced by the world when they're saying stoner, or what should we do? The law of the prophets say stoner. But this is, and we all know he didn't agree with them, but this is where a lot of the church misses it. He didn't agree with her either. How do I know he didn't agree with her? Because at the end, he said, go and sin no more. Biblically correct. So basically, what he told the woman caught in adultery is he said, I accept you, but I do not accept your lifestyle. And if you're going to walk with me, you have to change. And he was real bold about it. He called her sin, sin. Well, how do you know he called her sin, sin? Because he said, go and sin no more. So he clearly told her, you're living in sin, go and sin no more. Listen, you do no one favors by lying to them. The trick of this, this paradox that we're living in, the trick of this is accepting them but not accepting their behavior. Accepting them but at the same same time requiring and setting a standard for them to live up to. And be bold with it. Come on, I said be bold with it. I love you because that's what the Word of God says. Hold to the truth in love. But it doesn't just say hold to it. It says speak the truth in love. I love you but I believe something in your life needs to change. Glory to God. Be bold with the gospel. I had had a young lady attacking me on social media because of something I posted about Jesus and staying true. And I said, anything that opposes the word of God is evil. Man, I I love to start dumpster fires online, apparently. I don't really try to. I mean, hallelujah. I just kind of, I want to help. And I put something out there. I'm like, oh, I hit the hornet's nest with this one. But listen, this is amazing. I wouldn't back down on my position from the Word of God. Now, I'm going to share something with you. She blasted me publicly in the comment section. But then a week later, she messaged me privately. She said, this was her message. Y'all don't know who she is. Her lifestyle is in conflict with the Word of God. And she reached out to me. She said, I've got some demonic activity in my house. How do I get rid of it? Amazing how publicly coming against me, but then privately when she needs the answer and she needs Jesus. But the reason she knew she could come to me is because I wouldn't back down. (laughs) I wouldn't shy away from the answer. And I did it in love. Hallelujah. You got to do it in love. But you cannot back away from the word. We got to be, this is the answer. He is the answer. If you're going to be light, be bold with the answer. Now, i got to tell you this, and I tell them this in evangelists. There is a difference between boldness and rudeness. You're not called to be rude. Don't let me see you holding a sign that says God hates anybody. You need Jesus if you're holding that sign. 
Don't stand outside of places condemning people for their life choices. Stand outside of places and say, I know you're about to make a difficult decision, and this has got to be difficult. How can I help? Be bold with what you have. And when you do, just like Jesus with the woman caught in adultery, you'll set them free. Because you'll give them Jesus. Some will say, I'm a light. Number three, to live his light, we've got to stay connected to him. John 15, 4 through 5 says, Remain in me and I also in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must, be, it must remain in the vine. Neither do you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Now this last part's key. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the source of light. So if you disconnect from him, you will not be light. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. Without him, we have no light. Without him, we have no life. I am life and the light of men. Listen to me, you've got to stay connected to him. We know Galatians 5, 22 through 25, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Your life is supposed to be a life connected to him. And when you're connected to him, one translation says, when you give control to him, he will produce these fruits. The fruit of the spirit is what the world needs. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, temperance, self-control. These nine fruits will change their life. And they're supposed to see that fruit from you. But the only way you produce it is by staying connected to him. You got to fight to stay connected to him. What does the Bible says? It says, immediately the enemy comes to steal the word which was sown unto you. The devil's always after that word. He's always after your connection with God. He's always after your life that has been committed to him. But you've got to make up your mind, I will fight to stay connected to my Lord and to his word. Can I get an amen? amen. And then finally, number four, if we're going to be light, we must live generously with our lives. Be generous with your life. 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19. <clears throat> Verse 17, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. Sounds like Matthew 5. Let your good deeds shine out. But let them be rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. Not only what we have, but also him. Willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. We ought to be generous with our lives. If I could sum it up for you, it would be by this quote by John Wesley. I don't know if you know who he is. He was a man who poured out his life for the gospel. Started the Methodism movement, what we know as the Methodist Church. When he first started, there was four of them. When he was done, there was 132,000. It's said that he traveled 250,000 miles by horseback preaching the gospel. I haven't done the math, but they say it's enough to circle the earth ten times. At 83, he's quoted being mad at his doctor because his doctor said he could only preach 14 times a week. He wrote 600 different pieces of literature, preached 40,000 sermons without technology. Historian Lecky says this, that the revolution that destroyed France would have also been the revolution that destroyed England, but John Wesley. Why? Because the revolution that destroyed France was made mostly of the middle class, the downtrodden. Those were the ones that joined the revolution, but John Wesley reached them with the gospel. So instead of joining the revolution, they joined the church. Now listen to this quote by John Wesley. He said this, Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, 
in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Now, when you read literature by John Wesley and you read how historians write about him and scholars write about him, it's funny because they tell you he was not an eloquent, he was not a beautiful mind. He was a very simple person. You know, especially in that time period, the 17th, 18th century, a lot of them, the way they wrote was very complex and very wordy and very deep and intellectual. This was not John Wesley. But he had this simple truth. Do as much good while you can. To everyone you can. Everywhere you can. For as long as you can. What is he saying? Be generous with your life. Be generous with your life. And as you're generous with your life, it'll make a difference in the lives of those around you. I remember the Good Samaritan found in Luke chapter 10. You all know that several people, the ones who were supposed to reach, the, the, had walked by the man who had be, beat up and left on the road for dead. But along came a lowly Samaritan. And I love it. As you read it, it says that he put this man on his own donkey. He took him to the inn and he cared for him himself. And then he told the innkeeper, I will pay his debt. And even if it runs over, don't charge him, but I'll take care of it. What is that? That's being generous with his life. Generous with his life. And as you're generous with your life, it'll make a difference in the lives of those around you. 1 Peter 2.12 says this, Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior. And they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Philippians 1.27 at NIV says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come to see you or you only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we're going to shine as light in these last days, <laughs> we have to be generous with our lives. I encourage you, when you go to the grocery store this week, be generous with your life. When you're out at work and you're with the family, be generous with your life. And we're not just talking about finances here. That is one aspect of it. But just asking people, how can I help? What do you need? This is something I've been striving to do more and more of with my own life. You know, the other day we took the family to Lion Farm and just trying to help. There was a lady, she was carrying this giant mum plant and I could tell she was struggling. She was an older lady. And so I just said, can I help you with that? And I ran and got her a little dolly and she put it in the dolly and she was so grateful. And, and I was standing in line to pay for my pumpkins and she's like, thank you for helping me, you go first. I'm like, no, you go first. Just being generous with our lives. How can I help? There was a young man on a slide. He couldn't figure out how to get, you know, it was one of those slides that had the burlap, burlap sack. And so he was trying to, he couldn't figure out how to put it down. Well, I'm here, I can help. Be generous with your life. Trying to help him with his. I let go of my burlap sack and it went down the slide. <laughs> Aldo had to grab me one and bring me a new one. Our lives, your vessels of light, that's supposed to be poured out for him. Be generous with your life. Be like Jesus. I love this about Jesus. You know, we looked at it last time I preached about when he was traveling from one destination to another and it was like 160 miles on foot that they were walking, but yet in the middle of that journey, they stopped at a town to minister to people. Not so concerned with his destination, but how can I help somebody on this journey? How can I be generous with my life? How can I be an ear that will listen to you? How can I be a shoulder that you can cry on? How will I be somebody who can be for you, be there for you in the middle of the storm the way that Jesus was there for me in the middle of my storm? You know, in this song that Dop was playing was so stern in my heart last night when I was praying, I give you everything. Withholding nothing. holding nothing. Come on, church, let us be generous with our lives. You're called to make a difference. You're called to make a difference.